and was doing this number between, the, you know, on the other side of the tree. That still affects my dreams sometimes. I was 10 years old, 1984, and my uh, my uncle had this dog named Sam, and he loved going off in the woods and playing and chasing deer and whatnot. And uh, typically, my uncle could whistle, and within you know 15, 20, 30 minutes, he would show back up. And this particular day, he didn't, and so he asked me to go out to the wood line and. Uh, holler for him and see if I could, you know, get his attention and get him back to the house. And so that's what I did. I went out to the wood line and uh, to get there, I had to cross a field that's completely fenced off, a big pond in the center. So I crossed the field, went through the fence and just went 20, you know, 20, 30 yards, if that, into the woods and started hollering for Sam and I wasn't hearing him bark or getting any response. So I started walking eastward and uh, as I got further, I started just getting this uneasy feeling. And um, back then I didn't under, really understand, you know, the feeling that I was getting or what could be causing it. And, um, I just knew that I had this uneasy feeling. And at one point I, I stopped and I kind of focused in on this one tree. Um, it's as if I knew something was there, but I couldn't see anything that was there. and. As I'm staring at this tree, this thing stepped out from behind the tree and we just stood there staring at each other. I was I was asphyxiated on its eyes and its face, um, just not understanding what I was seeing. I knew nothing about Bigfoot at the time. I uh, hadn't really heard of it. And um, this, I'm sitting here looking at this thing, not having a clue as to what I'm looking at. Um, I was, uh, I don't remember experiencing fear in that moment and maybe shock um, and just trying to understand what I'm looking at. And uh, we just stared at each other. It was maybe 10 to 15 seconds. It wasn't a, uh, you know, it wasn't a long ordeal and uh, it had no facial expression, no emotion on its face that I can remember. It was just a, a blank stare. It's probably the same way I was staring back at it, you know, the, bl the same blank stare most likely. but. It, uh, it turned to its right and walked up a hill, and as it crested the hill, that's when my whole demeanor changed. The, like the fear kind of kicked in, and I just turned and took off, you know, got through the fence, I'm running across the field. At this point, I'm, I'm crying and, and uh, you know, pretty shaken. And on the way back through the field, I noticed that my, my father had shown up. So I started yelling his name, and he heard me as I got closer to the house, and as I crossed through the fence, he was coming out off the back porch and, and uh, of course I ran into his arms and just frantic and crying and he's just trying to settle me down and, you know, ask me what happened, what's going on. And uh, he took me in the house and finally got me calmed down and he wanted to, you know, of course he's asking me what happened, why am I freaking out? And I tried to explain to him what had just happened and what I'd just seen and, and he basically just tried to convince me that you know I was young and impressionable and was seeing shadows or something and uh, just I got you know spooked myself per se and we just kind of left it at that. That was kind of the end of it. It was it was a crazy moment in my life looking back on it and I put that away, kind of lock and key in the back of my head for for years. Um, you know it was it took me a little while to get over that, but I would say within. You know, within a year, I just got to where I didn't think about it anymore. In 2013, um, just on a whim, one day, I decided I want to go on a hike. I want to get my kids out in the woods, you know, maybe hit a creek and just spend a day out in the woods, enjoy nature. We got up early and it was just after sunrise. We got out to the location and we took off and was having a good day, good time. And uh, you know, we were a mile and a half, maybe two miles in and 
we were going down the trail and so I had four boys with me and they at this point were kind of out ahead of us you know doing what boys do having fun making a lot of noise and enjoying themselves and we're walking along and all of a sudden I had this overwhelming feeling and um my my eyes actually watered up that's something I have never I haven't said in any interview but my eyes watered up and uh immediately I recognized the feeling that I had because it was the same feeling that I'd gotten when I was 10 years old and it was almost uh like a dreadful feeling in that moment because I had my family with me and you know I was thinking to myself please don't let this be what I think it could be for whatever reason I was drawn in that direction um almost as if I could I hate, I hate saying this, but it was almost as if um, I could sense, in a way, the direction I needed to go. I felt that I needed to go into the woods off to my left. So I walked in 20, 30 feet, started scanning, and behind this big brush pile, this thicket, there I saw these three heads sticking up. I don't understand what this feeling is that came over me each of those times and I've had it happen since then um, once I got into the research I've had it happen a few times again um, you know I'm not really sure I'm not sure if it's something that's intuitive within me or um, I mean there's lots of possibilities my my father was infrasound sensitive um, he was one of that two percent of the population that is um, so once I started really diving into the subject, you know, I saw these theories about the, these things using infrasound. So I really dove into that thinking that maybe I'm somewhat sensitive to that. Um, but there's no way to prove that that would be the case. When it hit me, there was some sense of fear within that feeling um, because I recognized it. And, you know, some of that may have came from what had happened to me as a child mm -hmm. and recognizing that feeling it may have been heightened you know by the fear in the moment um, knowing that I may be possibly getting ready to see something that I hadn't seen since I was a kid and something that traumatized me and you know am I getting ready to experience this again now I have my family with me so there was a lot of things in the moment that that just whizzed through my mind you know all these different things and uh so I'm sure that that had a lot to do with it. Um, that day, the feeling was stronger than it ever has been. And, and I equate that to my family being with me and you know, being a father wanting to protect your family. And, and, uh, and I immediately turned around, walked back out to the trail. I told my wife, we're going to turn around, let's get the kids. And she knew something was wrong, um, but went with it because she could see that I was trying to act as though nothing was wrong so that I didn't, uh, didn't uh, give any thing off to the kid. It was just time to go, you know. And um, anyway, uh, my wife kind of played along and just didn't ask me any questions. And when we got home and the kids, once the kids weren't around, of course she was like, what, what happened out there? What was that all about? And um, so in that moment, I had to... I had to fess up to my wife about what had happened to me when I was 10. I'd never told her about it. And then had to tell her that I just experienced whatever these things are again. I just seen them again. And like literally that's probably been the hardest part of all this for me was telling my wife these two crazy stories and, and just hoping and praying that she would believe me. That night, um, I just decided that I was gonna go back out there by myself and I was gonna go hike off trail where I'd seen these things and and uh, yeah, I expected to have another encounter and my whole thought process was, I need to go out, I need to see what these things are, I need to experience these things more, I need to figure out what they are. The next morning I was out there by myself at sunrise and uh, went in exactly where I had, I had went off trail when my family was with me and um, I heard some things that day. I heard a whoop and and uh, 
was experiencing knocks and rock clacks. I didn't know what those were at the time, you know, like I knew nothing about the subject. Um, I was out there for four days straight after that. I didn't go to work, I took off work. Um, it was just, it became almost an obsession to figure out what these things were that I was dealing with and why I was having to deal with them because you know, at the time I didn't know other people were experiencing these things. Um, as I dove into the subject, I started, you know, seeing that there are other people having these experiences and whatnot. And it just progressed from there. I started seeing these things. Um, I just went about it in a way, I kind of fell into a progressive, a, 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 I kind of fell into a progression of um, making myself predictable and doing the same things over and over and over when I would go out to this place. And they started um, interacting with me, two juveniles in particular. Within a month, every, the things that had happened to me when I was a kid, I was okay with it at that point. Um, I was actually kind of glad that it had happened because it had put me in, I felt like it kind of put me in the position that I was in at that point in 2013 for whatever reason. Um, but I just, I took a deep dive. I started looking at every theory that I could find and really diving into these theories and trying to figure out if I could prove any of these theories correct or wrong. And, and um, it uh, it just never stopped. It just kept... I just kept moving forward. I set myself up a hike, an off-trail hike, and every time I would go out there, I would do the same exact hike. And the reason I was doing it was for me because I wanted to um, I wanted to get to a point where if something was different on my hike, I would recognize it. You know, it's like um, like you go into your house and you know where everything is. You go into somebody else's house and you don't have a clue as to where everything is. So I wanted to get familiar and be very familiar with my surroundings um, so that I could see if any anything was being manipulated or things were being moved off or onto the trail. And, you know, I'm just looking for any, any sign, basically. And um, they started... Uh, they started following me and at times one would move ahead and I would notice, I would start noticing things or, or hearing their movement and when I would get focused in on one, the other one behind me would do some break a branch or twists and breaks of saplings. Um, there were things that would be left on the trail that wouldn't be there the day before. And, and mind you, this is a trail that I created so it's not like other people were going into this area and and you know, picking up on what I was doing and hoaxing me or anything like that. Um, it was as if at times they were doing things almost, it was almost like they would do it to see if I would notice, you know. Um, sometimes it would be minute details, sometimes it would be obvious things, you know. Uh, and as that went on, uh, I started leaving granola bars, things like that out. I ended up setting up a bait station or what some people call a, a, a gifting st spot or whatever you want to call it. I, I, I call it a bait station because I'm just trying to be honest with myself. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to bait them to this, this place, you know, and I started out just leaving everything out in the open and I eventually created a, a situation where, um, something would have to get into this bait station, open it up, and that would tell me for sure exactly what was getting into it. These things would almost be waiting for me. Um, you know, I would see them in the background as I was going down off this cliff into this spot where this bait station was. And this is, it, was it was directly above what I, I, I coined it the nest at the time. It was basically a, a large tree that had fallen off of this six foot drop off, six or seven foot drop off. And then four other super big trees had fallen on top of it, and it created. In the summer, it would grow, it would be all overgrown, and it created almost like an igloo, um, and like this thing you could go up inside of it. Like in July, it would be like five degrees cooler inside this thing, and um, and at the top of it, at the the top root ball, there was a big hole, and there were times when I would be coming down, and I would see their faces peeking out through that hole, and. 
this spot where I started leaving originally all these things, um, they could literally reach out from that hole and, and grab them. So that's how close I was getting, you know, knowing they were in there. Um, but I was just having to, uh, not fear the situation, you know, oddly enough, the one thing they would never take was oranges and squash. And, uh, I thought that was odd, you know, like oranges are, you would think any animal would love an orange. And, uh, it turned out to be the same case in my next research area, actually. There was one spot where, um, they would both funnel in behind me and I had this tree that I would, I would sit down at. And as they came through this funnel area, there was why they funneled in this area i'm still not sure but every time they would and once i realized that i would sit this tree was probably 40 yards from where this funnel area was and um and i would see them coming in and they would they would stop there in this this thicket that they would funnel into and uh they would throw rocks around me never hit me you know but um that's when the when the real interaction started i'm sitting there they know that I know they're there and I'm seeing them, you know, throughout, I may sit there for 20, 30 minutes and, and I'll see them peek out four or five times. But, um, I say interaction because that's where they first started tossing rocks around me and, and, uh, they threw sticks a few times. Even I never had any verbal communication with that group out there. Not once. And I tried, I tried. Altogether, there was five that, I, that I'd seen out there. And there was actually a sixth one that I'd seen one time, but I wasn't positive if it was, if it was one of the other individuals. And in the moment, I just wasn't in, if, looking from a distance through a thicket. I thought I was seeing a completely different one. Um, I can't say for sure, but there was definitely five that I'd seen um, in that group. and. This is one of the things that threw me off in the beginning of, of getting into this research and reading what other people were, were reporting. Um, you know, all these reports that I was reading was talking about the sagittal crest and things like that, like commonalities. And what I was seeing within this one group that I assumed was a family group because there was two adults, two juveniles, and then a, a really young one. And the male had, had a huge sagittal crest. He looked like a, a bodybuilder. The female was very large, but she had more of a round head and the young female had more of a round head. The young male looked, he didn't look like the others whatsoever. He had more of a square head. He had a hairline, no hair on his face. You could see his ears, his ears were bigger. You could see the skin through his hair because his, his hair was thinner. His build was thinner. Um, he, his shoulders weren't as, wi as wide. The first time I saw him, I wasn't sure if I was seeing like a homeless person that was living out in the woods and had been there for years, you know, just filthy dirty or, or what have you. But um, as I got more close up visuals of him, I uh, started understanding that he was one of these things, but he looked completely different. And it really baffled me because, if, you know, typically we, we, think, we tend to break things down according to our humanistic ways and, and you know, human uh, characteristics and so my assumption in the time was that these things would look like their parents if I was dealing with a family unit and it, I wasn't seeing that visually. I was seeing like four distinct different characters basically and the youngest one was only about two foot tall and I only got to see it once and um, I didn't get a lot of details out of it because it was a, a short quick thing that happened. I saw one of these things when I was 10 outside of West Plains. I'm 200 miles away now and I've discovered a, a what seems to be a family group, you know? So I started really wondering, are, is there more of these things in Southern Missouri than what people can even fathom, you know? And uh, that, went, that went for a couple of years and uh, I, I ended up taking one of my fighters out there. I was a, a pro MMA coach and had a gym in Springfield and I had a one of my fighters in particular was ex-military and I thought he would be a good candidate 
to, to take out and I wanted to show somebody these things so that I could talk about it because at that point I had my wife to talk about it with and that was it and I really wanted to express some of this stuff to people that I trusted around me and um, I felt like one of those people needed to see these things so that I could talk about it I, I would have some backup you know and uh, I took him out and it was a horrible experience for him he uh, he got to see one that day he actually got to experience a few things that day and when he when he did see the one that he got to see which was the young female it um, kind of broke down his, his the whole peridium in his mind that he had established, you know, because he'd just seen something that it's not supposed to be real. It's supposed to be a legend, you know, and and uh, so it kind of changed his whole aspect on life in general and things he's been told that aren't that aren't supposed to be real, or you know, it, it made him question a lot more. But I had to hike him out of the woods right, right after it happened. He, uh, he kind of went into shock. He turned ghost white. Felt like he was going to throw up. His eyes watered up. I mean, he was just, he was blown away that these things were out there. Even though I'd taken somebody out and they got to see them, I got to start talking about it more openly. I still wanted to bring out some kind of proof. And uh, one day I gave chase to one. And after that, everything stopped. Chasing one, one time, and everything was over. It was like I, it's like I, I ruined the, the situation that I was in, you know, I was very um, predictable. And that day I did something that was that they didn't expect and was unpredictable and it just completely ruined it. It's this guy named Mark that I used to know. And he's like, hey, you know, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing good. He said, hey, uh, I've got a friend that's having some weird things happening on his property. Uh, he thinks there's poachers on his property. I think it may be Bigfoot. Uh, would you want to come out and check out the property? I said, when? And he said, tomorrow morning. I said, let's go. I'm in. Let's go. So I picked him up the next morning. We went out to the property. We spent the day hiking throughout this 400 acre property. And uh, sure enough, we're, we're hiking along and I start getting that feeling. I turn around and I catch one peeking out from behind this rock outcrop and he had never seen one out there. He was having, he had been grunted at um, and had rocks thrown and uh, but had never, never caught one of them visually. And in that moment, he was able to turn around and see this thing peeking out at us too. So it was his first visual also. I dove into the research out there and basically um, went through the same process. Um, I set up a hike, did the same things every time I would go out there, so that was super predictable. They start, you know, I'd get rocks thrown around me, and things would be moved on and off the trails, and I would start seeing breaks and snaps and twists, and, and then I started hearing things, you know, around me, and picking up on their movements and how they're moving in around me and whatnot, and I started seeing them. I set up another bait station. Uh, I set this one up differently, made it a... Uh, made it easier for me to determine what was getting into it. And, and uh, the ones on this property actually followed suit. And it's something I failed to mention. Um, in my old area, I had a closed system. And um, I ended up just leaving uh, granola bars and protein bars. It was easy because I always had those on me when I would hike anyway. And they would, I figured if they saw me eating them, you know, while I'm out hiking, that they would be more apt to try them and not be scared to try it, you know was my thought anyway. They would take the things out, take them out of the wrappers, put the wrappers back in and close it back up. And um, the same thing happened in this new area. Uh, within six months, they were hitting the bait station. And then a few months later, they started closing it back up and leaving the wrappers in, back inside of it. And so it was really refreshing. It was also super interesting that this group at this other place were doing the same thing, you know, and these, this other group kind of followed suit and were reacting in the same way. At times, it felt like they were leaving things for me, like we were almost trading, like they were bringing stuff with the hopes I would keep bringing stuff, you know. Uh, one time, uh, I left the bait station. I happened to come back by that day and I glanced down at it and 
my what I'd left was gone and there was a, a rock with some green stuff under it so I walked down to it and it was mint leaves and um, it immediately just threw my brain for a loop because when I left the things at the bait station there was a swarm of gnats on me and I set everything down and I stood up and I was you know waving my arms around and stuff and then I come back through and there's mint leaves sitting there uh, underneath the rock and uh, for whatever reason my brain attributed that to you know possibly them seeing me swiping all these bugs away and you know you can mint, mint leaves you know you can rub those on you so I really felt like um, the routines and things that I'd put together you know were working again I'd also started tracking these guys in this new area more in my old place um, I didn't focus as much on tracking I just I had uh, hoped that they would be interested in me and at this new property there's times I would go out and I would get nothing and so I would start tracking and uh, using my tracking skills to to find areas where they may be hanging out on the property versus them coming to me up meeting Randy Harrington and a couple other people that I got involved and I brought them in in July in 2018 and first time there you know we we caught them on thermal we were having rocks thrown they had like I brought these guys in and they got to have these crazy experiences the first time they were there with me a thermal reads heat so it's it's not like a night vision like night vision uses an IR light and uh, infrared and it still allows things to hide like they have to be exposed to be able to see them whereas um, thermal you can see their heat signature through through shrubs through thickets it's really hard to hide from from a heat signature over time we've noticed certain characteristics um, like if we're facing them at night and we can be viewing them from 70 yards and Typically, we'll, we won't see their whole body. They'll be peeking from behind a tree or they'll be, uh, you know, around in a thicket area looking through the thicket. Or most of the time when we were catching them, we would catch them from the shoulders up. They would be uh, poking their heads up. You know, there'd be four or five foot tall grass and they would just be poking their heads and shoulders up watching us. One of the things that we noticed right uh, pretty, pretty quickly, and Randy had already experienced this, but he just hadn't seen it in any other instances yet that he had been involved in. But um, at night when we're facing these things, they will, they'll freeze. They will slowly, so, so you're seeing the head and shoulders. So the first time we caught one on Thermal out there for a minute and a half, this thing dropped so slow that you couldn't even tell from that distance that it was moving until half of it was gone. Um, Randy has a, a thermal system that he had put together to where the camera is mounted on a, on a monopod and it's attached to a screen that hangs around his chest. So we would turn our backs to them, trying to make them be more comfortable. Um, and we would still be able to film them and we would be able to watch on the screen. So we noticed pretty quickly that when we would turn our backs to them, they would move at full speed, which is very fast. I mean, super fast. And we tested this out. There would be times we would be filming them. We would have our backs to them. And uh, when they would be exposing themselves, I would turn around. And they would freeze so um, it was telling us things like they think we could possibly see as well as them at night um, they may understand that our eyes work off of movement and that just may be because theirs does we started seeing certain characteristics and we look for those you know if we if we get a heat signature that looks like a head and shoulders or a head sticking out from behind a tree we'll immediately turn our backs to it and in Typically, it should be moving faster. It should expose itself more. On thermal, you can you can tell if you know, like if you see a deer, you can see that it's a deer. You can see that it's a rabbit or or what have you. You know, um, you get the full shape of whatever you're looking at. And the thermals, the new equipment that we have, you can see detail, all kinds of crazy audio. We have some things that would be considered speech on audio. We have. We have some chatter that sounds an awful, lot, uh, an awful lot like some of the Sierra sound chatter. Not the language within uh, these Sierra sounds that Scott Nelson has worked on, 
but just the chatter part. We've got knocks and, and whoops and you know all the normal things, breaks and whatnot. Um, we have them coming into our camp. We we started we would leave camp at night and leave recorders out. And uh, one one time in particular, we left camp and they come down off the ridge. You can hear them coming through the through you know all the thicket coming off the ridge and they come down and one of them sniffs the microphone and uh, and then you hear a zipper zip and unzip 17 times. Um, they methodically that night went through everything on our tables. We had uh, we had some tables out in an L shape and one side of the tables is all equipment and equipment bags and then the other side is like um, you know our burners for cooking and um, all of our utensils, things like that, you know, food. Um, we, we leave food out with the hopes that they'll take something and we'll notice. And uh, anyway, on that audio in particular, after we listened to it, Randy started going through everything on the tables and like literally methodically followed the same route that they were following going through the things on our table. And um, the only reason that we had known and picked up on that is because Randy's OCD. Um, we got back and there was one thing that was different and had been moved on his tables and uh, he recognized that immediately. You hear us coming back to camp and uh, there's a loud, loud break. Um, the tree that they broke was like that big around. It was huge and super loud. You hear the cooler, my cooler lid thump closed. Um, so they had been getting in the coolers. Um, oddly enough, they, they find our recorders and they pick them out. It's just like I, I told you, was they came into camp, the first thing that we hear is something sniffing the microphone. There's there's other times where we have set out our recorders and had them camoed out. They look like logs, small logs. And we have one instance where we set this log down and 30 minutes later you hear something making its way up to it. It sounds like it sits down beside it, it picks it up, and then it says something into it. And then it walks off with it and sets it down a, a, a little ways away. You know, I find arches out there. Um, I find two little small structures in particular that I've associated with them because one of them in particular is kind of, it kind of helped me find them in different areas on the property originally. But like we don't find the big structures like you hear people talking about, the TP structures. Um, we're not finding those, we're not seeing those on this property for whatever reason. One of the cool things that I find is usually within 24 hours of a rain, a good rain, I'll go out there and we'll find, I'll find holes that are being dug and the holes will still have the sticks in them that are, they're digging the holes with. And another odd thing about that, I shouldn't say odd, it kind of makes sense actually, but um, during the times when we are finding these holes, there has been, we, we know due to the tracks that there's been a very young one. Um, back three years ago, there was one with six inch tracks and I started finding these holes after rains pretty, pretty, pretty regularly. We got to a point and that stopped, we couldn't find those. Well, now we have a new set of six inch tracks and we're finding these holes again. came onto the property um, through tracks there was there were five there were two adults two juveniles and a young one um, the two juveniles that we were interacting with um, they have since left as far as we can tell because we're not finding their tracks anymore um, the one that had six inch tracks is now up to about nine and a half inch and there's a new set of six inch tracks so Right now at this point, just due to, due to tracks, I can say that there's four. And this is just going off of like the recent ones that we had that aren't on the property anymore that seems as though they've left. Um, according to the track size, and this is just comparatively to humans, but me and Randy had been discussing the, the idea that these two juveniles at some point, you know, all species, when their hormones kick in and they start going through puberty, um, in the animal world, they're immediately ready to, to go out and find mates. So we had discussed the, the possibility that at some point we're going to lose these two juveniles and they're probably going to disappear from the property and not be back possibly. And uh, it seems that's 
as though what has happened. But if if that is the case, that kind of gives us an idea of possibly not age wise because we can't tell the age by the size of the foot, but by the size of the foot and them, you know, vacating the area could point towards a time frame for them um, size wise. You know, we can't tell age from that, but according to the size of their feet and their growth, it kind of gives us an idea of possibly when they may be hitting puberty and ready to, to breed or mate and go out and find, you know, find their significant other. There's all kinds of data that we're able to pull from the tracks that I don't, I don't think most people would think about, but we've been in this lucky situation to where I've been able to cast the tracks of the same individuals for two or three years in a row. Um, versus, you know, most people are lucky to go out and find tracks and cast them. I've, I've been finding Scott out there for, for quite some time throughout this process. And um, a few years ago, it was actually the year that I first brought the guys in. And, and it was the first time I changed up my routine or done anything different. And because I brought these guys in and we did some different stuff that I didn't normally do and broke all these routines that I had, I decided to go ahead and set up a new hike because there's some other areas that I want to see if I can pull them into um, throughout my hike. And uh, so uh, I came back the next week and I start finding scat on my new hike after I'd set up this new hike. And then there was scat at the bait station. And then, you know, I, long story short, I was finding all this scat and they had these, it had the seeds in it and I had never seen these seeds before. and Took us a little while to figure it out, but we finally found that they were pawpaw seeds. And I was finding pawpaw seeds whole, not chewed up, in their scat all the way through December that year. And the odd thing about it is that pawpaws, if they haven't all dropped off the tree before the first frost, they drop within three days. They, they quit ripen and drop. And so, after beginning of October, typically, there's no more pawpaws. Now, are the seeds gonna be on the ground or you know under the dirt? Sure, but if an animal is eating pawpaw seeds, they're gonna chew them up. They're not just gonna swallow them whole, they're gonna chew them up to get the nutrients out of them, you know, or fiber or what have you. And these are whole seeds that we're finding in the scat. So it kind of may point to the possibility that they're storing food somehow specifically pawpaws um which you know how do you how do you how would they store a fruit and keep a fruit good for a long period of time you know at least through december i cast a disc i believe it was early 2014 may have been late 2013. Um, this was left by the adult female from my old research area. This was actually um, in my ash pile about 15 foot from my camp, or from my tent. Um, it had rained the night before and she came through this high grass area next to camp and just happened to step in the only spot where she could have left a track, which was my ash pile. So we were able to cast this. You can actually see coal and stuff, coals in it and stuff. Right here, you see this curvature that's due to an arch. You can see some curvature here. Now this is this is overpour right here, but you can see some arch right in here. And then, if you look at any of the tracks, this one doesn't show as well. But you know, as far as the ball, but we have we have an arch that goes or runs along the ball of our foot. Also, um, you can see points of that arch in it here and here. I believe this to be a female also. Um, and the reason I say this is because. In my old area, I was able to, you know, find their tracks and at times I would see them and then I would go back and look at the tracks afterwards. And one of the things I noticed with the jubies was that the female in the old area, the female jubie, her feet were more feminine looking for lack of a better way of describing it, um, which, you know, it's this, this long heel and the, the skinniness of this track. And when we got into the 400, we found that we were in the same situation. There was seemed to be a male and female juvie. The female's tracks were longer and skinnier, and um, the male's tracks, the young male's tracks, a little shorter, but much bulkier. Like the ball of the foot is really massive 
compared to the, the young female and it was the same way in the old, in my older research area. So we're seeing a, a difference in the tracks themselves when it comes to the fem female and the male tracks. I try to be out there every Sunday. Um, I go out and just do my routine hike and my normal stuff. Even if they're not on their property during that time, I still go through the process um, just to keep myself, you know, in, in that steady loop and doing the same things over and over and over. That is a that is a big part of it, you know. And I think that's a mistake a lot of researchers make is they they go here, they go there, looking for evidence versus finding a spot and going to that spot over and over and over, and not just over and over, but being there as often as you can. That the more you become a normal thing in, in, in their area, you would think the more apt over time they are to let their guard down maybe. Yeah, that's that's the biggest part of this is I've had the, the uh, capability to go out there and be there a lot and often and consistently. You know, the consistency is, is huge. The normal data consistently over and over and over and that's where you start kind of figuring, hoping to figure things out, you know. You get, you get something once or twice, you can't pull much out of that, but you get it 20 times and you see, well, that happened at this time, which is a consistent time during the day or during the evening, you know, you start, you're able to start putting together pieces of the puzzle. It's like we're out there trying to put together a puzzle with no box to look at, you know, and, and so it's a matter of just trying those puzzle pieces over and over and over and over and consistently, I guess. <laughs> I've heard the vocalizations. I've had stuff thrown at me. Well, there was one uh, down in, uh, near Pocahontas, Arkansas. He inherited some land. He decided to, you know, drive up there and sort of check it out. And uh, so he had to go up a dirt road, you know, windy road up up, up this uh, Ozark Mountain to get to it. And as he was making his way up there, he noticed a furry something, not large, just uh, just a little you know, a, a basket of fur in the middle of, and it was obvious it was it was an animal of some sort. And not wanting to hit it, he came to a stop and honked its horn at it. The mountain was going up on his right side and going downhill on his left. So out of the right, out of the brush, comes Mama, a, a female uh, Bigfoot, goes over there, reaches and picks up the baby with one arm, puts it on its back, and then go and makes its way, barely, you know, barely even turning to uh, take a look at him, and makes his way down the, uh, the hillside. And he's watching this go down there. Well, at this point, a rock about the size of a baseball hits the roof of his vehicle and then makes his way down. So he turns around and not more than five, uh, five or 10 feet away from his vehicle was daddy, a full blown male. He said, if you, have, if you found the biggest guy and put uh, football uh, shoulder pads on him, you'd almost meet, meet up how big this individual was. And here's this thing not more than five, ten feet away from his, from his vehicle doing this number with the, you know, scowl on his face. And then all of a sudden he just, he just heaved back and he just, oh, right at the, right at the, um, right at this guy. I mean, he didn't hear it. He felt it. Made his ears ring. 
he jumped back in his car and he kept on going up to uh, uphill. Unfortunately, that's a, that's a one lane road going uphill, which the only way back is going downhill. So he went all the way up to the gate of his property and he parked there because there's just no way other way back down that down the hill or mountain. And he could hear that thing and rocks being thrown at him. And then finally it started to die down. He got back in his vehicle and he started heading back downhill on his way not too far away from it uh, from where he first saw the, the baby squatch uh, he found he saw a dead deer on the side of the road he did not break very much going down that hill and he didn't stop until he got to uh, Harding Arkansas which I believe is in closer to the Pocahontas got himself a cup of coffee and he just sat there staring at his coffee for a good hour I'm sort of you know, opposite of the current legal system you're guilty until proven innocent to me. And uh, it's not that I doubt everybody. It's just due to the subject at hand. As you, you got to dig through a lot of dirt to find the gold. And so I put him through a litany of, of questions. What he told me um, would, seemed to be very valid. He not only did he see a swatch, he saw a whole family. It's really difficult to get an image of these things. So Absolutely. why do you think it's so difficult to get an image of them? For one, they don't want to be seen. The experience that I had after all these years, the only reason why I saw the one behind the tree and that we saw the one behind the tree, I honestly feel is because he wanted us to pay attention to him and not uh, which was over to the right, and not whatever was going on to our left. I honestly believe that there was a family pod over to the left that was get, making their sure that they're out of the way. So is that a, a common thing, a distraction of some yes. sort? Yes, it, it's almost a protective, um, you know, uh, almost being protective. You know, pay attention to me while family pod makes their exit. These things are huge, obviously, and yet they kind of move through the forest, which is difficult to do sometimes. Why do you think it's so easy for them to maneuver through these forest areas? It's their backyard, not ours. Um, nine times out of ten, you know, they do. They walk in sort of a forward fashion, almost gliding, right? Um, there's a reason for that. Why would an eight foot something, uh, you know, walk forward? If you're running in, into brush, you're not going to stand straight up. You're going to lean forward. Uh, the way their fur and and uh, and stuff like that, they can easily camouflage and go into the thicks. Um, a friend of mine in New Mexico said that he saw a full-grown bull elk go into a um, run into a vein of brush, reared his head back, and then just disappear into that brush like it wasn't even there. People say, why did it rear his head back? Because if it would head forward, its, it's antlers would have got caught up in the brush. These animals know what they're doing. They know how to go. They know how to maneuver around. It's rare or if there's ever been bones, carcass, uh, resting spots, you know, poop in the woods. Um, why do you think it's difficult to find those things or have there been those? As uh, far as skeletal remains of a squatch, probably not. I'm not going to say 100% that, it, that there has never been, but if there has been, uh, whoever did it is not making it well known. You got to remember the population of, of Bigfoot, which is probably uh, higher than it's been in a long time, 
But even then, you know, uh, just to say in a conservative manner that there is anywhere between 30 to 50,000 uh, squatches in the North American continent. And they're like, 30 to 50,000, good Lord. I said the North American continent. And to have that population spread out, and we're talking North America and Canada, you know, <laughs> that's not a whole lot to go on. Now, you can't swing a dead cat around this area without hitting a deer, right? You throw a deer out there in the woods, that skeletal remains, and we're talking bone and hair and everything, will be gone within a month. It is even more incredible to find the the remains, the skeletal remains of a bear or a or or a cougar or even a deer, as far as that goes. There is no absolute in this research. The first time a researcher says, "Oh, that's absolutely a squatch," you know, whether it be a recording or what have you, that's when my that's when the back of my hair started going, okay. There's too many variables, or what one of my favorite sayings is, when all things possible has been explained away, only then can you look to the impossible. That wood knock that you heard, what well, was it near a creek or a lake? Well, yeah. And it, and it sounded more than once from that lake, uh, creek and stuff. Yeah. Are there beaver in that lake? Oh, well, yeah. Beavers slap their tails out of territory to let you know that you're, get, you're coming too close to their nest. Well, what about this monkey sound that I recorded? Do you mean like this? Yeah. Yeah, that's a barred owl. There's just too many variables in this in, in our woods to explain it away as being a squatch. Only until you are able to discount or explain away the possible can you look to the impossible for the answer. So you've heard the Sierra tapes. Yes. And what do you think of those? Why do you think of Scott Nelson's research on the language of? I am very positive, I mean not 100%, but I am very positive that the Sierra Sounds has, um, or, or has some veracity. Uh, some of the sounds that they've made has been recorded not just in Sierra Sounds, but uh, like the two-tone how the oh, 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 oh. I mean that's been recorded not only in, in Sierra Sounds, but I've, 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 uh, I've heard it myself here in Missouri. I've heard recordings from Colorado with that same sound, and uh, in Texas. What does it mean? I don't know, but it is a commonality. It is a sound that they make that you know is common throughout the you know throughout time and and uh, distance. So I think that has a lot of veracity to it. Uh, I think uh, Scott's fi finding is just as good as my theory or anybody else's. Am I going to say 100% that Scott is spot on right? Even Scott won't say that. He did research. He did his diligence. He put in uh, his experience, you know, government training experience, and came to these conclusions. I wasn't looking for it, but it found me. Um, back in the uh, late 80s, uh, me and a group of guys, we were playing ball or whatever, and we heard that there was a kegger going on, and the old resort was basically an old hunting lodge, long deserted. There was still a path going back over there where you found a bunch of uh, broken down old buildings and, and an in-ground swimming pool. This in-ground swimming pool was perfect for holding a bonfire and throwing your cake there. So we showed up there right about dusk. The trail that goes to the old resort's a good, a good half mile in order to get to, you know, that spot. 
and uh, we we followed that trail back there. We checked everything out, and there was nothing, you know, no evidence of anybody being there recently. So we headed back, and this is like the last part. I'm going to talk in dusk, you know. And we're, there was still a bit of daylight, but not a whole lot to go by. The group that I was with consisted of three guys in front, a couple of guys in back, and three guys that I, I mean, the three of us that I was with. And we were approximately, you know, 50 to 100 feet uh, separated. As we were walking down there, um, we started to smell of, of a real bad odor. I mean, it fell on us like a green fog. And, and uh, Gene's like, Ron, what is that smell? And I said, dude, I don't know. It, it's about to make me sick. It was so bad, you wished it was a skunk. And then uh, Gene took about, you know, 15, 20 steps, and then he just stopped. And he looked over to his right. So he was looking to the west towards the setting of the sun, you know, right at dusk. So you couldn't even see the sun. You just saw the the glow and and he just he was just staring out there and I said what and he goes oh my god maybe 25 30 feet away from us was a tree about the width of a, of a telephone pole and behind this tree was a large furry we couldn't make out the face and stuff but we could make out the shoulders and the you know the fuzz and and had its hand around that tree and was doing this number between the, you know, on the other side of the tree. Now, I look in the back and I make sure that the guys that was in back of us weren't, you know, messing around with us. And then I looked up front and sure enough, those guys were accounted for as well. And we're staring at this thing probably, you know, good 15, 20 seconds. Doesn't sound long, but for a Bigfoot experience, that was a lifetime for us. Gene just started shaking. He goes, I can't handle this. And he took off running. Well, being Gene was the biggest one out of the bunch of us, if he took off running, I wasn't going to stick around either. And I started to rationalize, okay, maybe the smell that we smelled was, you know, someone got sick and vomited on the side of the trail or something and got, you know, stinky. Or maybe what, whatever we saw behind the tree was that was, you know, gently swaying in the breeze was a cedar tree or something. Even though there wasn't any breeze. And I said, I'll tell you what, let's go back and see and, and see what, you know, if anything's still there. So me and Dave, who had the keys to the vehicle, uh, we went back. And I knew exactly where we stopped because there was a, uh, there was a limb across the trail. And sure enough, the smell was gone, and there was nothing behind that tree. About 10 years ago, we were uh, setting up camp, and we were in the bottom of a holler, and the sun was just setting on the west on the west side, so the sunshine was hitting on the east on the east uh, uh, ridge of the holler. And all of a sudden, we heard what sounded like wood being twisted and then crack, and then it hit the ground. And, and sort of sliding down the ground because you know there was a lot of brush. It was uh, late October, you know. We, and I looked up, and just at that point, on top of that ridge, with the sun just hitting the the edge, the top of that ridge, was this big black something running like a bat out of hell. from my hometown. I went to school with him. I'll just call him Bill. I never knew him to be crazy or far out or weird, just one of the guys. And I'd heard stories all over town from people about old Bill's talking about Bigfoot again. He saw Bigfoot, yada, yada, yada. I never had a chance to meet with Bill until I was in my hometown one time and he came in the cafe I was in and because I'd worked with Bill in plumbing houses that he had built, we sat down, was visiting, and I had heard at that time that uh, 
he had quit talking about Bigfoot to people because everybody's calling him crazy. He started telling me, he said uh, he was out, I believe it was in the spring, and he was out mushroom hunting. And he sat down under a tree and was resting, and some rocks started falling around him. And he got to looking, and there was a Bigfoot behind a tree throwing rocks at him. And so I stopped him at this time. I said, I said Bill, I said, what do you mean throwing rocks at you? Trying to hurt you? He said, no, just, you know, playful. Throwing rocks, getting my attention stuff, and playing peekaboo behind a tree. He has went back several times and confronted them, and the same thing kind of happens. They do the same thing. He kind of had this visiting friendship with them. He, he never backed down. He never changed his story. Uh... I know Bill, and I just can't imagine him being the character that would just make up something like this. And then he also told me, he said, there's a woman in town, a very prominent woman. He said, you would know who, are you, who she is. She come to me, and she had a story about Bigfoot herself when she was a young girl. I'm guessing, her, it sounded like maybe she was around 10, 12 years old, lived out in the country, and she lived few miles away from where he saw it at. And her story was uh, her dad was out cutting wood or doing something. It was evening time and supper. And the girl went to go get father. And she was following the fence row down to get to him. And she come across this Bigfoot. And they stood face to face for a while. spot that he just can't believe. I said, well, take me to it. Well, it's sort of my ice cream cone. I want to, you know, I want to get on it for a while. So finally, one evening, he finally took me to where he was talking about. He said, you're not going to believe this. And what he would do is he would take his truck. He would park across the road from where he saw this activity. He would take an old horse blanket used and cover himself up. The mask is set. And he would sort of, you know, sit back there and watch what was going on. Uh, he took me there, and we pulled over, and we pulled over to the side, and we pointed where, where the activity was taking place. It was at an elementary school area. The elementary school was here, surrounded by brush. I mean, you know, woods to the left, woods to the right, woods to the back, but open clearing area for the elementary school and playground. And then right across the road, more woods, right? And I said, this is where it's taking place? He goes, yes. It just, don't, I don't know why. It doesn't make sense. And I said, Bill, it makes perfect sense. He goes, what do you mean? I said, it's free food and circus, man. I said, think about it. During the night, they come out of the brush they go through the dumpster. They eat whatever the kids don't. And I said, but wait a minute. And most of this happens during the winter, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, uh-huh. They go in. They come in the dumpster. They, they have free food. During the day, they hang out in the brush. They stay still. And they're amused on, what, on the goings on of the kids. It's free bread and circus. I think that's how the, I think that's how our relationship with the squatches uh, are are pretty much all the time.